Welcome everyone to the Engineer Whisperer podcast. Today, my guest is Peter Johnson, and I'm so happy, Peter, that we made the time to to be here today. So welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. Yeah, I, thank you for uh, inviting me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate coming on the podcast today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So let's jump right in. Tell me sure. a little bit about your family and where you grew up that we call the background. Sure, sure. So um, I grew up in uh, England, right, the United Kingdom, uh, in a town called Luton. Um, most people know Luton for its airport, and that's very common. Um, so that's the town I grew up in. That's the hospital I sort of was born in. Um, and yeah, so L Luton is a, if, if you don't know what Luton is, it's a... Um, an industrial town so historically uh there used to be loads of factories auto you know automotive car factories and it's very well known for making hats like straw hats back in the past oh. which is kind of like the name of the uh Luton Town Football Club which is called the Hatters right so yeah that that's the town I grew up in um it's it also has a reputation of not being the greatest town to live in um but I'm trying to change that reputation <laughs> And what was the family, your family like? Sure, yeah. So my family um, is, uh, we, you know, we were always we always do things together as a family. Like we always um, ate at the table together and for dinner time. It was like a rule of um, we had to engage with each other when we we're over dinner, right? We we couldn't have this concept of someone's on the computer or on their phone or anything like that. And my mum was very traditional in that regard that this is our time. We've all been like to school or college um, or, you know, dad's been to work. Yeah. So we all now have a few moments together to share our story. And we would kind of go around the table of expressing maybe some stress we had or, or um, just kind of saying how the day went. And that was sort of like a routine. Uh, it sort of became like a, um, a de-stressing <laughs> mechanism for for all of us i think oh, how big of a family uh not very big so it's me my sister and my parents so it's very you know when you hear with some families they're like you know <laughs> really big we, we were just like you know two siblings and, and and the parents and i think it was quite nice having a sister as well i think my sister played quite a big role in um having a shared experience with someone right um in the family which was quite nice yeah I grew up as a sister too so yes uh, I, I also the other side is the the, the bickering the conflict so <laughs> right. that also comes with the sister if you ask my brother so so what kind of a child were you growing up um interesting so I think um I I was always a curious child so um always wanting to know how things work um i didn't like the answer i don't know i always wanted to like find out the truth <laughs> right and right. i think um that truth sometimes people don't want to say it and i sort of figure that out as an adult but as yeah. a child i was like there must be a reason for everything <laughs> right? um my mum would also say that i was quite you know, as a toddler, I was a bit of a, a hard work in, in, in the sense of I was crying a lot and screaming a lot. And um, now being a parent and having my son, uh, my son also has similar attributes. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so I think um, I, I don't think I was the easiest child to bring up, I imagine, certainly in that sort of toddler uh, age group. But then what toddler is easy to bring up these days, right? <laughs> I wanted to say, yeah, that <clears throat> what about later? <laughs> the years following a toddlership okay. yeah so later you know I, I was always a little bit of the quiet shy boy right I, I wasn't really um I was definitely an introvert and I preferred making friends with like individuals rather than groups of people I felt very uncomfortable in large in groups of people I, I used to pick one or two people and be really close with them and then spend my time like that and as I sort of grew older i realized um actually it's nice to to maybe be friends to some level with more people than being very very close with with one or two people because i think i got hurt uh as a child when you know you become too too closely knit with someone yeah and it sort of becomes 
too close and you need some space. And I think for one of my childhood friends, we got very close. We were almost like living out of each other's pockets, right? <laughs> and I think um, I got a bit hurt from that friendship and so did the, the other friend. And um, mm -hmm. I think I learned something from that, which was maybe getting too close is not a good thing. And actually we need some space, uh, you know, as a friendship. And I think um, as an adult now, I've learned that, you know, having more interactions with a wider group of people is actually quite healthy because you learn different perspectives. You can have a wider group of people to share ideas with. Right. Yeah. And I think that philosophy is definitely something like I've, I've taken into adulthood uh, and as I've matured. But as a kid, I, I wasn't really thinking like that. And I was very, you know, picking out individuals that shared my beliefs and very selective on being friends with them. Yeah, I think many of us can relate to that because um, as children, as it comes to an age when we are, how to say, we, we are bullied or picked on because of something that we have. You no, know, I'll, I'll have freckles. So I got picked on because I had freckles and nobody else had freckles. Right. That I couldn't change, do anything about it. So yeah, I the other side is having someone who understands you. It's still great to um to start life with. Now, was there any family tradition that you remember that you grew up with? Maybe you still value and you in, you brought it into your life now as a parent. Sure. I mean, so um, so my my mum is uh, Italian. She's from the south of Italy. Right, she was born there. And we used to make it a family tradition that every year we would go to Italy and see our relatives. And that was almost like every every year we would do that. And um, I enjoyed seeing like a different culture. I enjoyed, you know, hearing different languages, different foods, uh, different temperature, different climate, different everything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think um, it was so different from living in Luton and the experiences I had there that it was almost like um, being dropped into like a different world. And it was quite, it was like a nice escapism from reality. And I, I really looked forward to those holidays, like in August every year. And so nowadays, um, one thing I like to do is also go back to Italy, go back to the same place I was as a child, you know, and take my son there in, into the same beach where I was as a child. And give him those experiences that I enjoyed and yeah I think it's um it's very magical because I have like double memories now of going to <laughs> to those places right memories as, as like a really young boy uh even like a, as a baby there's pictures of me in the beach in, in that same beach that my son is now going to and it's yeah, it's quite magical I think because it's uh, for me it's personally quite magical because I had really good times there uh, with my family it was a time when I saw my parents um not working and you know really unstressed and that was yes, quite nice yes. where they could be themselves and not have this sort of routine of work right which which yes. creeps into people's lives and yes. you can actually see more of the person um the parent right behind like uh the routine which was quite nice I could see my dad relax and I could ask him more questions and then I would normally be able to when maybe you know we've got finite time in the evening when everyone needs to have dinner and go to bed at a certain time and continue the routine <laughs> yes so yes it was nice to see everyone like uh you know just in the relaxed state and um just enjoying the moment together and enjoying like getting to see my relatives right who don't speak English and having to step up and try to communicate in Italian so that was quite nice as well because it, it gave me a challenge and I liked the challenge and I was um you know totally up for it because I had no choice right the my relatives weren't willing to speak English back then even now possibly um <laughs> but it was it was fun I enjoyed the challenge and um then I think when you're in the country itself and you see everyone speaking a particular language there's more incentive to kind of give it a go right where back in my hometown of Luton yes. um, there wasn't big incentives to kind of learn and use that language at home yes yeah it comes easier I remember when I went and lived in Germany for a year 
when everybody speaks it around you and breathes it around you and eats it and you know, <laughs> the language it's yeah it's not an exception it's part of everything else like breathing it's life yeah yes and you realize oh okay why am i so worried about if i make a mistake they they're gonna understand me they're gonna help me and they're gonna help me understand it they're gonna help me learn it so uh, again, it's they they want me to communicate with them, and I, I'm sure that was the same with your relatives. They they just enjoyed Definitely. your company and wanted to communicate <laughs> with you. So if you tried just a little bit, even they were like, "Yeah, we'll help you. Let's figure it out <laughs> together." So yeah, the no, key thing is trying, right? In that yes, case, yes, <laughs> yeah. It's almost like the mistakes are not so hmm, risky anymore, uh, and your failures. So yeah, well, I'm curious uh you know as you said every almost every summer so growing up what do you think that created for you you know experiencing this culture and that culture experiencing two cultures as as you were maturing and growing up um so i think i got to see i uh, understand my mum a bit more better as well because i think you know, my mom came from that culture and um, the South of, you know, the South Italians have a, a very different way of thinking than, um, uh, you know, someone in Luton. Right. So I think seeing where my mom came from, seeing where she lived and what she enjoyed and um, really made me understand my mom better, I think, in, to, in the sense of her opinions on things, because sometimes we we clashed. Right. We didn't always have the same opinion on things, especially as a teenager when I was growing up. I see. I I wanted to, um, you know, be very uh, an entrepreneur and wanted to do things that were quite risky, right? And my mum, you know, with uh, sort of um, strong values, were like, "No, we need to get a, a job, right? You need to work. You can't be, <laughs> you can't be going out and being an entrepreneur." And I think some of those um, beliefs weren't just my mum's. I think it's a kind of society at that time, at you know, time and place thing where people were living in the south of Italy in the 1950s and things had to be rebuilt after the second world war. And, yeah. you know, it, it was kind of quite difficult, um, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of hardship where yeah. and I think going there and having, hearing those stories really kind of helped me to understand the context in which my mum grew up in and that what the world was like then. And that was helpful for me to understand my mum better, if that makes sense. It almost sounds like it helped you understand and discover your values, what you want to value and who who you want to be. It's that part of identity, maybe, by understanding where you came from, where your mom came from. We understand ourselves better when we sure. search for our identity. Yeah, I think maybe like if you had if I had to dig really, you know, dig really deep into like what does this mean for me. I wanted to know, you know, what it means for me as well, right? Because ultimately my family are from, you know, I have family in the south of Italy and I wanted to explore and understand them um, just as much as I want to explore and understand family I have here, right, in, yeah. in the UK. Yes. Yes. I can hear the family is one of your values. And um, I think it was your mom's too, and then it had been passed down, so... Great, great job, mom. <laughs> <laughs> if she's listening. Well, let's then move. So you're curious kid. You were a curious kid um, with sounds like amazing and strong family values and family to grow up in. And later, you know, high school and then I'm curious how, where, how did engineering show up for you? Sure. So, um, so basically I started college, um, trying to do electronic engineering after, um, you know, the first course I did at college was a electrician course to be an electrician. And, um, I then, you know, spent some time working as a, let's call it an apprentice, right? Well, wait, how <laughs> did you choose that? So was that you who chose it or, you know, family helped you? Who inspired yeah. you? Because as a, as a young adult, 
it took some time <laughs> for my kid to figure out that, oh, what I want to do is translates to studying engineering. So how sure. did you find that? So if, you know, if I, if I was being very honest, right, um, when I was looking at, I've always been curious about computers at school. I, you know, used to love the IT lessons, um, but IT at school, information technology at school, right, was, wasn't programming or coding or <laughs> anything like that. It was using Microsoft's uh, products, like Microsoft yes. Access, yes, I PowerPoint. Yes. And, you know, I had to create a PowerPoint presentation on how Stephen Hawking uses assistive technology, right? Um, and this was kind of like what IT was at school when I went to school, right? And we're sort of talking like 2005, 2006, right? That sort of era. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I kind of got I, I enjoyed using computers i enjoyed i was fascinated by them um because i thought you could achieve a lot more you know with them the internet and you know all these software packages which you had to put in like cds back in the day uh, and it, you know use them and there was like encyclopedia and there was a lot of things that i could see value i i, I think i could see the value of using computers very early on um okay. but at the same time i didn't want to be a IT engineer. I didn't want to be an engineer that um, just maintains computers. And I thought the the market was flooded, and I thought if I stay down this IT IT uh, sort of route, I'm going to struggle because everyone wants to do IT, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So wow. my thinking was, um, if I become a, a you know a tradesperson, right, someone that uses their hands and it's very practical mm -hmm. i could set up my own business i could be self-employed i i could um i think the the entrepreneurial spirit in there was like i could be someone you know self-employed was very important for me having that agency that yeah. you know you, um but i think um you know i i ended up doing an electronic well electrical installation course right mm -hmm. and this electrical installation course i ended up you know connecting wiring looms and like you know we had to build different circuits uh at college right and yeah the uh, a tutor would come around and mark them and eventually there was like an exam where you're giving a a circuit diagram and you had to pull up the sockets and the light switches and use metal conduit and you know it was very um very hands-on and practical as well as some theory you know because you don't electrocute yourself and there's some regulations around um wiring that needs mm -hmm. to be adhered to yes. so so i completed that course and i ended up working on um you know an apprenticeship right i got an apprenticeship as a electrician mm -hmm. and it, uh, basically this this apprenticeship wasn't just electrical there was a lot of other things i had to do to keep my apprenticeship which was a lot of like maintenance and other kind of work that was not really related to electrical installation and in the end i was getting um you know if i'm being very honest bossed about a lot by a bunch of electricians towards the end of their career to do the work they didn't like to do so yeah. for example yeah. <laughs> we had to like connect loads of like lighting looms and different lighting fixtures together out of a one box and just you know spend the whole whole day just building up mm. lights right for which had to be installed in a particular university mm -hmm. and then one day um this this gentleman who was kind of with us you know he was like visiting um i think he was trying to get some experience um he said to me why am i doing this why am i connecting these lights and you know light fixtures and i said it's my job i'm i'm, I'm an electrical apprentice right mm -hmm. and he said i'm an electronics engineer and um i went to university and you know i'm having a one-year break uh you know uh to kind of come out and um get some work experience um but didn't you consider going to university and you know studying to do electrical engineering if you're that interested and to be honest, I was like, no, like university is not for me. It's, you know, I'm quite keen on doing electrical installation. And I think um, that evening or a week after that sort of idea stuck in my head of actually, why have I accepted to be an electrician? Why am I just doing this? Because um, I didn't realize there was another path. I just thought 
this is the way right yeah <laughs> yeah and yeah, just yeah. no one has mentioned the word university to me right um, up to that point oh. right so How that idea never entered in my mind of you, you know university is not not for for us or not for me right it wasn't yeah. a thing I, I even yeah. considered yeah so um I I completed the electrical installation course and you know during that apprenticeship it wasn't working for me because I wasn't really getting the experience I wanted even uh, or needed to complete the apprenticeship so I ended up um basically looking for my next options and my next options were you know working in a factory and you know starting at the bottom of the chain and you know starting to build a career there mm -hmm. um and, and these were like temporary jobs so I started out in a, in a temporary job uh trying to do packaging right for for um products which had to be sent as so I was in like a postal room mm -hmm. uh, and then I ended up in a temporary uh job at a factory electronics factory doing so wait so you thought about college and university but you didn't choose it or not yet well not yet I think um okay okay so what so happened was um I had a lot of like thinking about it and you know these courses don't start immediately so I, I was kind of on like summer break right where okay. I couldn't even if I wanted to go to a university or wanted to go to college I couldn't go now <laughs> because yeah, yeah. um so okay. I thought do you know what I'm gonna spend the summer working um oh okay so we're talking about the summer okay okay I'm with yeah, you now. okay yeah mm -hmm. so so basically the summer right mm -hmm. me my, I guess what I was trying to do was get some money so I could go to Italy and re re repeat the kind of <laughs> family um, tradition of going that to Italy. That makes sense. So I wanted to work. And mm -hmm. at that point, um, you know, um, I was also trying to determine what to do next. Do I set up a business? Do I work for someone? Do I go to college? Do I go to university? I so, um, so in the end... Um, I ended up taking a job as a electronics technician, right? Um, so I thought, do you know what electronic? If I was, if I'm going to study electronics, or if I'm going to um, study in another course, maybe it's best I get some proper work experience first, and maybe I could study this course part time, right? And then I could, instead of getting loads of student debt, I could actually, you know, do something part time, and maybe um, mm -hmm. kind of like the apprenticeship, but like. For electronics technician yeah but i should mention i also at this point went back to college so um i went to college and i studied electronic engineering uh for, for two years right? so you did make the decision okay i okay. did i did <laughs> um but when i left college i was then looking for for a um an apprenticeship right because college in this college in the uk is, is not the same as university it's like a kind of institution um in you know after school and between and and kind of before university right so is it like a two year or yeah one year it, yeah so it, it's kind of um so i had a, a national diploma uh, in okay. electronic engineering which is kind of equivalent to uh, a levels um okay. so it's kind of a, a vocational route okay 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 thank you mm -hmm. so i completed that so that summer you know after after working some time i went back to college and i okay. got that qualification mm -hmm. um and then I was looking for basically work experience in the in the industry, right? Because now I transitioned from being an electrical installation to electronic and electrical engineering. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, so you know, I completed my final project, which was like a free stage audio amplifier on, on PCB, which I had manufactured uh, in China. And I felt like I'm ready for this, right? <laughs> and um, so then I got a job at, as an electronics technician in Luton for a, a company called Anritsu, which is a telecoms company. And my boss at the time who hired me said, you know, you've got a choice here. You can either try to learn programming and, you know, work with the Java team because there's some Java software there, okay. or you can join the software testing team uh, and learn what they do <laughs> and see if you can help out there. Oh. So um, that was a choice that was given to me. And I think it was made very clear to me that, you know, you to succeed as, you know, to succeed and be an engineer, you need to have a degree that 
um that was something that was mentioned right mm -hmm. uh, and i um and so i think that kind of um shocked me a little bit because i think i i left college thinking you know world is my oyster and i can kind of achieve what i want right you don't need an academic piece of paper that's gonna um define you right you you can put work in and you can get rewards yes. right yes <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I, I'm saying yes, because I had that mindset at some point in my life too. So you're taking me back to that point. Yes. Right. So, um, so my manager at the time offered that I could start a course um, part time. And mm -hmm. what it kind of meant part time it was sort of like distance learning. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of like, like evenings. after work. Yeah. Yeah. After work. And, you know, I remember driving, um, to the university in the evening to do like maths lectures right and and learn basic maths like you know year one maths and so it was a long uh, haul of like evening lectures sometimes um and just kind of putting in loads of hours right so wait, uh, which one did you choose so your manager said you can work with the java team or the software so which so team did you i choose? think the choice was made for me he, he kind of said there's a choice but the reality oh. was the reality was right um i i didn't come with programming skills so to join the java team um would have been hard for me and i think he pushed me in a testing direction because i joined oh. as a test technician Interesting. right electronics test technician yeah. and i think um Maybe if I'd pursued that stronger, I could have maybe moved into that team. But at the time, um, I ended up working with the test team. And the test team were doing a lot of what I would call manual testing, right? So mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of coding involved back then. I when um, So I think, you know, product knowledge was more important than the coding, right? Because I think they wanted someone who would fit into the team and repeat what the team is currently really doing. Yeah. Um yeah. So that's the option I sort of took. And um, that's what kind of opened up a lot of things. Because then I agreed I would start studying a computing degree, right? Um, so that's where really the whole concepts of like programming and understanding the pain from running tests manually and repeatedly running them, I saw that as a pain point. And I was like, why are we doing this all manual, right? We need to... So I think that's where I started to realize, actually, um, you know, we can apply some scripting here. We can do some coding here. We can, you know, look at how we can improve the process. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's opened my eyes to a whole world of what what software testing is. And there was, the, you know, the first thing I did was something called the ISTQB, which uh, is International Software Testing Qualification Board. And it was like a multiple choice test of what are what is the ver what does verification mean what does you know validation mean uh, yes. what is black box testing system testing so there's a lot of like definitions that came out of that which was like oh it's a whole world actually this is a a actually a legitimate kind of thing right <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... i love i love how you um you were yeah maybe pushed into it but then like oh wow yeah there's a whole world and and mm. I can fit in, like I, I can hear them and, <laughs> and I can fit in here. Like I can yeah. and it's almost like you you experience the problem first. Like go, you know, like go experience how almost like not to do it, like how it's hard to do it. Go go experience. And then and then that's where our I think our resourcefulness and creativity kicks in is when we struggle and we have constraints, it's like, okay, it must be another way to do this. It must be a better way to do this. Definitely. Yeah. And I think when I, you know, I think the curiosity sort of kicked in as like, what is this new world? Right. And actually there's like books and there's knowledge. And, you know, I think the, the whole wonder of learning something new that I didn't know was, was like kind of, uh, you know, overpowering and it was so addictive to, I need to know more about this. <laughs> Well, of course, you were a curious <laughs> kid from the beginning. So you were curious, like, yeah, I want to learn. I'm curious. I am curious now just to, 
to kind of put things in perspective, did this did the company where the manager you know, suggested gave you options to go study uh, at the university? Uh, did they also sponsor you, pay for it, or was that out of your pocket while you were working? So, um, so basically, I learned about. Uh, we're looking at some options. So there was something called the open university in the UK, which is like a distance learning um, institution. Right. And so that was one, the option that was presented to me, you can go and study only at this uni and we'll pay for some modules. And so in the end um, they paid for like one module, I think. Um, but then I ended up leaving that organization because I wanted to get more programming experience and I wanted to, really apply what I was learning, right? And really start to get hands-on. And that wasn't possible with where I was working at the time. Oh, I see. And then I, uh, so I continued the course, you know, funding it myself um, and putting in loads of hours, right? I remember, you know, having to spend so many hours learning object-oriented programming with Java and figuring out what is all, you know, what is polymorphism? What, what are all these new concepts, right? How, because, um, I wasn't using, I wasn't writing a lot of software back then. So there's a lot of abstract terms and, you know, things I had to comprehend and understand before I could actually apply them. And um, that was, yeah, I think going through the whole OOP course um, was very time consuming. Because remember, I only had a few hours in the evening and I was like, you're really tired from work. And I was like, well, now I need to learn OOP. <laughs> and um I remember really struggling with just maybe materials and not having someone I could reach out to and, and kind of discuss these ideas. I really wanted to oh. discuss these ideas with, with someone. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the opportunity. So I had to kind of keep iterating in my own head on, um, you know, uh, you know, am I understanding this correctly or I'm misunderstanding this? There's a lot of like, yeah. um, you know, I wanted to validate my learning in some way and I wasn't able to do that easily. Mm. Well, I was curious because one of the one of the things strength that I believe that drives us to succeed is commitment mm -hmm. and and part of that commitment is uh, how to say it's stronger when you also invest your time and your money into what you're committed to so you know that's how I was curious um that you got a taste by being invited. Okay, we'll pay for it. But after that, you saw the value and then you committed um, your learning and to your learning to yourself, not to the company anymore, because then you find it yourself. So I think that's very important. And then I'm also hearing how important to you is commitment and, and follow through and dedication. And that's part of why I invited you here. I think um, that's a uh, really big strength of engineers and you are showcasing it right now that once they commit to something, you know, they're, they're committed. Like they're, uh, I'm, I'm here to learn, uh, you know, it's not a joke. It's, it's real mm. commitment. I'm going to learn about these and, and really put in the work effort and time and investment. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's a very like, um, good point i think like for all the courses i've done i uh, completed right the electrical insulation one i was fully committed right the electronic electrical engineering diploma which i completed again i was fully in right i, I was buying soldering irons breadboard components yeah. to build you know stuff at home and then when it happened to be computing right and com and, and and the reason it's computing is because that was the course right i then done the final year of that degree at the university of Hertfordshire, where it was a computer science uh, program, right? So I sort of took the first two years of that course and done a final year at Hertfordshire um, to to make it a computer science degree, right? And then I think I got the buzz that I was like, I need to continue with this <laughs> and um, do a master's, right? And I think the reason I was doing these courses was because I, I remember back to what that first manager said to me that you won't be a good engineer unless you have um a degree right and i think what he was meaning you know what i think what his intention was um was you need to gain as much knowledge as possible um okay thank you for saying that because 
I think some people think I need the paper. No, no, no. Not the knowledge. You see, I need the pedigree to to become a a good engineer. So thank you yeah. for, for emphasizing that. What, Definitely. What he so meant. I think, I think that's what he meant because that's how I interpreted it. Because I think, um, you know, so I've had people in industry who don't have these these degrees and they've done really well. And, really, you know, I think it's um, the way I interpreted it was I want, okay, I will, if there's a program I can study. And for me, I've done many courses, right? Not, not, not just degrees or anything like that. Um, if I need to learn something, I will find a way to learn that particular item. Right. And that's what I took. That's what I took away from his comments. Cause I think. Um, so Peter, then I'm going to go, I'm going to go, you know, like this is the very, <laughs> my curious question. Cause I can hear the commitment and it's almost like you committed. Now I can see not just to learning, but you committed to this outcome of, I want to become a good engineer. Right. So where is that coming from? Where is that want coming from yeah. for you? Why it, it, do you want to be a good engineer? <laughs> I think it, it it comes down to my values, right? I like, um, you know, you need to be the best you can be every day, right? Where you were only on this earth for, um, you know, 75, 85 birthdays, right? Maybe 90, 100 birthdays, right? Um, yeah, that's not a lot of time, right? Um, so why show up and not give it your best shot? Um, so I think for me, it's, it's about when you, for me, it's very, maybe I'm too black and white on this. Maybe it's like too perfectionist maybe, but I like to give it my all right. And whatever I do, if I'm, um, you know, if I'm taking a photograph of the Northern lights in Iceland, I want it to be the best photograph ever. Right. So get the best camera, get the best day, get the best location, just make if you're going to put effort in right it doesn't take a, you know a little bit more effort to make it really good so if you're really committed to doing that then you might as well go the all the full mile and complete it and do it good job rather than deliver mediocre responses and i think the reason i've i've um i aim to kind of give it a bit more effort is because i don't like accepting mediocre myself right? If I buy a product and it, it's not the best it can be, I get quite frustrated with it and I return it, right? So I want to see, I think I see the world in a very like perfectionist way of, you know, things need to be good, you know, and and um, if they're not, then there's something else that is out there that's better. So why accept less? And if and you can do something about it, you'll do something about it. I can hear that too. <laughs> <laughs> I I think, yeah, the only, I think it's just, um, I want to be proud of what I do. And I, I think um, I want to finish on a Friday and go, I gave it my best this week, right? Mm -hmm. um, within the constraints I was given, maybe there's, you know, there's some constraints there that I have no control over. And, you know, that's fine. There's something I don't have control over. I shouldn't beat myself up about it. But the things I can control, right, is the input. Um, and I think it comes from, you know, working and, and seeing different you know experiences like working in in a uh you can't control the outcome but you can control what you put in yes so if i if i show up every day and i put in this energy right there's no guarantee i'm going to get the reward at the end that's waiting for me but what i can control is what i what i put into that process and i think that applies to a lot of different processes right um if you're trying to like you know, be healthy and lose weight or, um, eat, you know, take, um, steps into improving your lifestyle in some particular way. You can't control the outcome because, you know, something could happen that has totally. That's the uncertain. Yes. It's <laughs> the uncertain thing. Yeah. But what you can do is like, say, well, I'm committed to this, so I'm going to eat less meat or I'm not going to have that extra coffee today because I don't want to have too much coffee or I may not have coffee at all. Yeah. And I don't want to put caffeine into my body. And But those are things I can control. And maybe in the long term, they're going to have some beneficial benefits for me, right? Um, so I think um, I, I started to get this mindset from seeing failure um, in, in my life in, in terms of starting out in my career um, 
when I when I wanted to move away from my first job with no experience in software testing yeah. or in the software industry, right? It's very difficult. I got loads of rejections um, because people just said, you don't have the experience. And what I could do was keep showing up and keep trying to learn and keep really being consistent with, you know, uh, my goal, right? Because I think things get hard sometimes and what you can control is what you put in. And that's the only thing you have at the end of the day, because there's a lot of external factors that we have no control over, you know, whether a company lays off people or whether an opportunity closes or, you know, the only thing I can do is show up. And if you're going to show up, then give it your best shot. Thank you. I'm a <laughs> believer in that, in that mindset too. And you remind me of something that I, you know, I, as my clients say, I preach about is the, the difference between making the right decision and making the decision right. Mm. Uh, and what you're talking about, I mean, the, the difference that I talk about is commitment. Mm. The, the difference between a good decision and a bad decision and a good outcome and a bad outcome in the middle is commitment. Even if you commit to a bad decision that you consider a bad decision right now, if you right. put in the work and you commit and you you find people, you gain knowledge, you gain experience. 99% of the time you get the outcome, you get an outcome that will mm. benefit you. So it's not where you start the label of the right decision or the wrong decision is the commitment that makes a difference. And I hear it so much in what you're talking about. And I, I have discovered early in my life as well, when I made a decision and then uh, I turned it into this is going to be <laughs> the right decision. I'm going to make it right. This is what I want. <laughs> so, you know, it's a it's that mindset of, OK, what do I need to do? How do I need to think? Who do I need to be in order to then, you know, get what I want out of this decision? Not the decision drives my life and the outcome. No, that's what I hear. It's. I think it's a really fun way to live. So thanks for sharing. Now, I heard you say, let's pivot a little bit, because I believe that we can't do it all alone. And I heard you say, as you were going to the to uni and you were learning about some concepts, you wanted to bounce those off and validate them with someone. So uh, who helped you along the way? Um, did you find communities or just one person? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's an interesting question. And I think it's something that still uh, can affect us in all stages in our career, right? Because we all need, we're all learning new things all the time. And we mm -hmm. still need, the learning journey doesn't stop there, right? What I discussed like 10 years ago, right? 11 years ago. It continues even to this day. And yeah. the thing is, we, like you said, we can't do this alone. It, it, it's a, um, so something that, um, so when I first moved to Cambridge, um, which is where I live now and where I spent most part of my career since leaving Luton, um, really, you know, Cambridge opened my eyes to community, right? And uh, there's a lot of like community in Cambridge, a lot of meetups um, and my man some of my first managers in cambridge really showed me the way in terms of connecting with that community and that was quite important so when i first joined here in cambridge you know i was in my early 20s and i needed really to see experienced people in the industry and really get to talk to them and understand their opinions and um at least that was helpful for some part of it um and these meetups were like there used to be like a um, something called like a lean coffee where before we would start a working day, there'd be a company in Cambridge that would be run, uh, would run a lean coffee where, you know, a bunch of software engineers in, in test or test engineers would all meet mm -hmm. people interested in testing okay. would meet and we would have poster notes where we could all write a topic. And then we would have a few minutes um, or 30 seconds to wrote on each topic. Mm -hmm. and the ones with, you know, the top, three or four, um, you know, would get like basically 10 minutes of time for everyone to discuss and talk about it. And that was really interesting because I, I could ask 
questions and raise topics of discussion in there and get people's opinions on what people were thinking. And as my way of learning uh, from more senior people at the time on really concepts, which I was still trying to grapple with myself. And so I was part of it, but one thing I, I haven't really had in my career is a mentor, right? So what I mean by this is someone with the label mentor and I'm a mentee, right? So I haven't had that in my career, but there's been engineers and coffee conversations and a whole bunch of people in the workplace who over time have been that mentor for maybe 30 seconds at the coffee machine discussing about something with me. So it's interesting so no... that you say that you haven't and then you validate it. <laughs> well, I didn't have one. I had like, you know, 30 <laughs> of them, Andrea. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe um... because you don't want to name them all. Uh, but you do understand the value of that concept. That's what I'm hearing of having people to learn from. I What I would have loved and, you know, something I will try to say to my son in whatever industry he ends up working in is if you can find someone who's been there before you and has, you know, who can, who's willing to learn, you know, who's willing to teach you some stuff and, you know, give you the opportunity to learn because not everyone's willing to do that. Yes, right? yes. And um, if, you know, if you find someone who knows something about some anything, right? It could be learning a guitar. It could be machine learning. It, it, you know, it could be maths. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. If that person gives you time, right? In, you know, and that time is for free and they're not charging you for that time, right? And mm -hmm. they're willing to teach you. Mm -hmm. Boy, God, you know, really embrace that because that doesn't happen often. And, um. It's happened to me rarely, but it's happened to me a few times where someone is willing to teach you something and give you that extra moment uh, to ask questions. And there's been a few people who've given me that time, right? Who haven't just brushed me off and gone, no, I'm not, I, I don't know the answer to that, or mm -hmm. I, I'm not the expert on this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't know. And I think that that's, yeah, I think I haven't had an individual mentor that I've worked with. Right. And I think that's something I kind of wish I had, you know, in my early twenties, right. When I was learning some of these okay. early programming concepts that well, what about I, now? Now I think, um, I basically am so honest when I don't know something and I may, if I don't know something, everyone around me knows I don't know something. Right? Oh, so you make everyone like your mentor okay, by saying, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Help so me. what what I end up doing is basically make if I'm struggling with something, I make my problem everyone else's problem because <laughs> I I need to know the answer, right? And the way I I will put in work myself, right? Uh -huh. So um you know, this last weekend I went to the Cambridge University bookshop and I bought myself a book on machine learning, right? And there's a lot of maths in there I don't understand. Um, but I'm committed to learning a little bit more than what I know today. Mm -hmm. So if I know 1% more today or tomorrow than what I know today, then I'm happy with achieving that goal, right? Because no one's making me learn this. I'm just curious on learning it because I think it's the world is changing from, you know, when I started my career 10 years ago, uh -huh. right? Yes. And if I know a little bit more about some technologies that I'm not using in my day to day, uh, mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, we can all use large language models to generate content, but do we yeah. understand all yeah. of the techniques and things behind it, yeah. right? Yeah. And I just need to know a little bit more of how these things work every day, not yeah. because I have to for my work, but so maybe you're curiosity. not making maybe you're not making a problem everybody's problem because that sounds like very selfish, but you're letting everybody know of what your right. problem is. So it's the the speaking up, expressing what you want, right, and and asking for help. Okay, this is my problem. Who can help? What suggestions right. do you have? Absolutely, what? yeah. I it's that, like that's crowd a key funding <laughs> for crowdsourcing the the oh, kind yes, of Oh yes, sorry, answer, crowdsourcing. Right? Yes. <laughs> oh, I like that crowdsourcing <laughs> problems and solutions. I have a I have an exercise uh for that as well myself that I I love it and when people commit to it and and decide to play it's so much fun so i'll i'll tell you about it 
<laughs> yeah, I love it. So, all right. So you moved. Okay. So, so you said you, you, you were studying for masters and then now you, then now you moved to Cambridge because work then. So you, or for that's the part of the uni or where are we in your timeline now? Yeah. So, so basically I, I done my, I've done both of my degrees, um, part-time. Right. And I, so with uh, the University of Hertfordshire, right. So I completed okay. the bachelor's with the University of Hertfordshire and the master's I completed also in mm -hmm. um, computer science with a project on web accessibility. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so these courses I've always been doing when I've been working. So I've never fully experienced the whole university experience in one way. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, you missed out on the on the, the social events at uni because you didn't go uh, full time. But at the same time, I was making a lot of social connections at work. And I was, you know, I was meeting people yes. in industry and me meeting people who were, you know, graduates or more experienced than me. And that was quite useful because I wasn't put in the pool of graduates. Right. I was treated as an experienced hire because I had eventually some years of experience and that was quite useful because then I was, I wasn't put on like a, you know, a graduate program and like everyone else who would have maybe been on that program yes. and then tried to been like, right, <laughs> I'm going to try getting the gig. Right. Uh, yes. And I think working with other experienced individuals really helped, you know, me understand what I wanted and understand what's possible. Yes. Um, than having a track made for me, up, you know, up front. And I think that was something that wasn't intended, but was kind of a, a consequence of what happened. And it sounds like that you're pretty happy with it too. Yes and no. So, you know, studying part-time, right, and doing distance learning and, and putting in energy in that sort of regard is not easy, right? It, there's times when you just want to finish work, close the laptop and not yes. have to do any studying, right? Yes. It's not the easiest option available, right? Um, so in hindsight, would I still do what I did? Possibly, because I know it, what I did has helped me in certain ways. But at the same time, I, I appreciate there's a time and a place for when you should be learning and giving you your full energy, right? Um, the perfectionist in me is like, how can you be learning all these new concepts and be working at the same time? Because you're not giving your energy into everything at once, right? And I think I did struggle with that sometimes, you know, because I there'll be times when in the evening I'm still thinking about work and I'm still yeah. wanting to go, ah, I want to finish that thing for work. Mm -hmm. But no, I need to put down, you know, my work and actually focus on learning and picking up other books and, you know, and starting from a different concept. But at the same time, doing that gave me a nice, a nice separation from work and study because when I did close my work laptop and I focused on something new, it was a totally different world. And the stresses of work didn't enter this world because they were different. And it was a, yes. I, it almost became like an exploration of something new that I didn't know about. Yes. And I think in one way, it helps me deal with the stresses of work because I knew when I finished my working day, I would have something to look forward to at the end, something new I could explore and learn instead of just consume content or, you know, whatever, whatever, or play sports, which would have been nice, maybe. <laughs> well, you know, Peter, you know, as I work with, hmm, with engineers who are you know, seasoned. Right part of the discussions that that we talk about in, in strategies and create plans is is create what you're talking about we're humans and we are it's such it's it's such a part of our dna to have the comfortable and then the the new the adventure side so it's what you're talking about it, it's it's the um, you can't go on vacation every weekend i don't know to I know, pick a really far away place to, to New Zealand. What you can do is you can go on vacation in your mind. Mm -hmm. It's 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 the learning how to stop focusing over here, letting go, closing your laptop, 
and then now focus all your energy on something else that is of interest that is full of curiosity then it's where the adventure is and then understanding that at, at some moment you're going to close that laptop to that adventure and then you're going to go back to the you know mm -hmm. the comfortable the the consistent the safe part and and to understand that our brain works like this we want mm. both of them and neither having this or that is not the answer is having both and and creating a life that has both is what's gonna make you feel fulfilled and and whole so maybe you didn't know this and you know it wasn't conscious and intentional right well i love how you're remembering those times and like okay there there was something good about it yeah definitely i think it gave me some purpose because i felt like uh i'm on the journey towards something right if i complete these courses if i learn this knowledge right it's going to serve me in some way and i think well we know um, how it's going to serve you. you're going to be the best engineer that you can be <laughs> Yeah, sure. I, I think it, it was important for me to feel like I was, you know, doing something about how I could improve myself, right? Improve my knowledge, improve mm -hmm. um, the situation I was in, right? Because yeah. I think we're constantly a work of progress. And I feel, I think like there's no such thing as, you know, now you become the best engineer in the world. I don't think that ever happens. I think there's constantly things we could be learning and growing, especially in technology, right, where technology is constantly changing, there's new tools, there's new frameworks, there's new processes, and there's never, you never reach that target, right? Um, but well, you're as, aiming to get there. Yes, as you said, it's not really about becoming the best engineer outwards, it's becoming the best me, and then using all those tools in engineering, in taking a photograph, as you said before, <laughs> <laughs> figuring out of of the Northern Lights. So it, yeah, changing the our world, our inner world will change the outer world through our decisions, thoughts, responses to, to it. Well, thank you for sharing. As we're coming to an end i do want to squeeze in some of the fun questions that i ask at the end of the podcast so um let's start with this one i'm always interested uh who makes uh, what makes someone um in a way you know a great human being not just a great engineer so what's one thing that you like to do in when you're not working when you're not working and you're not studying but that you're you're doing for yourself sure um so for me there's there's two things right one of them it, it sounds quite simple and it's not like you know I, I just enjoy playing squash right and um so i have a um i do have a mentor for this i do have a squash coach oh you do right yeah. right um so for, for multiple reasons right one accountability right if i know someone is waiting for me at a squash court uh, at a particular time i can't let this person down i need yeah. to show up right that's there's so no, powerful. Excuses. Yes, no that's excuses yeah no excuses so powerful <laughs> um i can imagine if i played an individual thing like let's say i was going to go for a run after work and it starts raining outside and then i'm thinking well maybe i'm going to you know, defer that run till tomorrow. <laughs> yes. And tomorrow comes and other things happen. Then I forget about the run. And in the, in the end, I go for a small walk instead, right? And maybe I'm not getting the full benefits of the exercise. Yeah. So accountability is really important. And um, But not just that, I actually enjoy playing squash. I, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert at it or any good. I do it really for, uh, for cardio reasons, you know, just to get my heart rate going up. And also... I enjoy it's almost like a stress relief, right? Smashing a board against the wall <laughs> does um I think it does things of like relieving stress, I think. I I definitely I'm not thinking about anything particularly because there's a lot of like trying to just eye hand eye coordination and getting in the right place in the court. I don't have the time to have any other thoughts. You have moving. to be in the moment. I don't want to lose <laughs> the ball or it hits you, right? Exactly. Yeah. Have you always be. have to be, you know 
positioning your legs in the right position and your arm needs to be in the right position at all times. So you haven't got time for anything else. <laughs> uh, and I think I like that. I think it, it's almost like you because you're so present, you don't have the time to think. And that is nice. You can mm -hmm. just be, right? Yeah. And I think that's why I like squash because, um, yeah, the health benefits and the kind of mindset that comes out of that and the endorphins you get after playing a game of really intense squash is like, you know, it's a really good high. You know, I leave the squash court going, I can't achieve anything now because I feel so buzzed, right? And yeah. that feeling is really addictive. And I think I, that's why I, I play every week. Um, so that's one, that's why so I play squash, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing I'm really into is astronomy, right? Now, what I mean by astronomy is I have a few telescopes, right? And because I live in the UK, the, it gets quite cloudy and it's not always possible to use, you know, the observing equipment to observe the planets and, you know, um, the, the solar system and the moons and all that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So I tend to read um, a lot of on astronomy, right? So I am, I, I read books on black holes um, and I also have, some astronomy publications sent to me e each month, right? Which just keep me in the loop of what's going on. And this is all just interest, curiosity again, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I wanted to be an astronomer <laughs> early on in my career, I may have, if that was the first thing that touched me, I may have, you know, taken some interest in that direction. Mm -hmm. But, you know, time has moved forwards and I really enjoy computing. And, you know, being an astronomer these days, I imagine you do quite a lot of computing to to draw pictures of black holes and things like that yes yes but I, for me it's it's a passing interest and i just i think it helps me understand the what you know the universe we live in right it comes back to like like we started this conversation discussing about you know understanding myself right um astronomy for me plays a part in also trying to understand the universe and our human's place within the universe right um and understanding you know what's out there understanding these these black holes and the different types of black holes we have why do they exist why are they you know what are the properties of of these different things we can observe and see yes um helps me understand my place you know, on this sort of small speck of blue dot right within the the greater atmosphere you know world and i think for me that's part of that journey too Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So we'll find you on the court, right? Would you still court? Um, <laughs> playing, hitting, smashing the ball, uh, or with the book, or looking up in the sky. Okay, that that's a good photo of you. Well, Peter, if someone would ask you to teach them something, you know, something that you know. Mm. what would you teach them yeah it's uh it's an interesting question right i think what i would can i can i ask can i say two things um <laughs> sure <laughs> one of them would be patience right because if you can have patience you can end up you can teach yourself anything right but how does um, one teach patience you're gonna have to tell me a little bit more Patience means I'm trying to teach this to my almost five-year-old son. It's very difficult. <laughs> but for me, patience is really like coming back to what I said earlier about, you know, you can control what you can put in, right? So don't look okay. for results tomorrow. Don't look for results this year, right? If you keep showing up each day and you keep putting in the energy, putting in the effort, okay. you will get something back in return, right? Mm -hmm. But don't expect that to happen tomorrow don't expect that to happen next month mm -hmm. right you need to look at like in maybe maybe five years i never expected to work at google right i never said i'm gonna do this and, and i'm gonna end up working at google i just kept showing up programming in python really passionate about it yeah. and things just show up in in your life if you're really committed and consistent and you know i think that goes a long way but you know, you need to be patient because the results won't come um, quickly, right? You need to put the work in. So yep. patience, and for me, the work was trying to learn and do things, uh, you know, programming in 
languages I, you know, I want, I'm passionate about, but put in the time and effort to really master it, right? You can do a few tutorials and learn the basics, but to fully understand the idiom, idiomaticness of that language takes a lot of time to master it. And, yes. and not to mention frameworks, which are a whole different thing. But like, <laughs> if, if you're really keen on something, right? If it, for me, um, books were quite a big thing because it meant if I stare at a screen and I try to learn, I may get distracted and I may focus on other things. Right. Um, so I think a book allowed me to detach myself from um, a screen for some time mm -hmm. um, yeah. right, to understand the concepts. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, if I, re you know, obviously when you're programming, you still need some sort some form of screen, but like to understand the concept, you know, the concepts behind the language or the concepts or, you know, some of the algorithms that, um, how they work right you don't always need to delve into the code to understand how the algorithm works once you've got that in your head you can then go right now i can program it yeah so, so patience what's patience the is one? one patience is one yes um the other one is resilience right oh. like mm -hmm. you're gonna there's gonna be so much failure happening right um failure i i like failure i embrace failure and what i mean by failure is you know failure could be that project that you worked on in your part-time you know your, your side gig just didn't go anywhere and no one really cares and or it could be you got rejected for that promotion or you got rejected for that job um and i think every time a failure event happens because we call it failure i don't know why it needs to be called failure it should be called like a a learning opportunity right um that's a time to really understand what we should be learning right what because if we learn from that experience maybe we need to pivot on something mm -hmm. yes. so for me the electrician thing right i gave it a go yeah. so i think the first thing is give it a, give it a go right um then fail because if you fail you'll learn something and for me, I, I learned I didn't want to be an electrician, but I gave it a go. I gave it my full all. Right? I passed all the exams. And then I realized this isn't for me. I need to pivot. And I think you only know when you need to pivot, when you it, it, when, when you basically give it a go first. <laughs> and so embrace failure, accept it's going to happen. Don't shy away from it. Because I think as a society, we get a bit scared with failure. We we kind of look at people's success, but we don't look at the journey they took to get there. So it's almost like the iceberg that's under the sea, right? We, we look yes. at the iceberg above the sea and yes. we go, oh, that's, that's the success, yeah, right? That's, 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 that's what's mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. That's what's on Instagram, right? Shiny, but we yeah. don't see the struggle they took to get there, right? Yes. And that struggle could be, you know, a number of rejections, failures, left, right, and center, and really pivoting and hard work and commitment and, you know, resilience to, to keep trying because sometimes things are going to get hard right and they're not going to go the way we plan right and oh, for sure that's <laughs> I, think... <laughs> I live with that truth that things gonna get hard like it, it's yeah it's not a if it's a it's a when and then how how am i going to respond to that right how committed i am to pursue it to push through it mm. Or is it something that I tried and then I learned from it, let it go, pivot, go somewhere else. So it's again getting back to the making the decision right versus mm. is this the right decision? Yes. So resilience and patience. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. What about this question? What is one of your dreams that you always had and what steps are you taking, if any, towards it? So, so, you know, we could look at dreams in different ways, right? We could look at them in materialistic ways. We could look at them in, you know, in a, in a sort of peace, right? Like spiritual ways, right? I think for me, um, it's having feeling like I know what my purpose is. So what I mean by this is when I, you know, when, when my time is due, you know, when my time is over on earth, right. 
I want to feel like I knew what my purpose was and like I'd done something about that that I have and also that I live with no regrets right so I think um my dream is really to to live with no regrets and and to feel like I've gave everything that came in my way a full go right I didn't shy away from any of it and that I live in peace right that like I think um we all want to like try things and try new things but I think we all need to feel like we know what our purpose is right and what I mean yeah. by purpose is um you know you know how you fit in to whatever system you want to call it right whether it's the work system or home system or whatever but like mm -hmm. you feel like you know yes. what part you play right yes and the yes. more connected you are with that I think the more it helps with the resilience piece and the patience piece yes yes so um yeah and just being at peace that sometimes you know things won't go our way and just accepting that and just going you know what it's just not meant to be on this occasion right and so I think the more I can do more of that, the more I will be living in peace and the more that will fulfill my dream. Because I think my dream ultimately is is to live with no regrets and, and to and to be fulfilled and, and have a fulfilled for life, you know. So I think to achieve those things, I need to do some work on my mindset, right? Around how I frame things sometimes because I think we're always waiting for things to happen in the future and go oh we'll be happy once you buy that house yes. be happy once you get yes. that and that never gives you happiness in the long no. run right because no. um I I remember when I first bought you know my first house right the house I live in that I was so happy I, I was like I can't wait until I live in the house it'll be amazing and then after years passed by you're no longer fulfilled in the same way as you were at the beginning. So I think in, in, in the end, these materialistic things that we put value on, because, you know, there's a lot of consumerism and, you know, capitalism that fund yes. these things and make us want and want these yes. things. And a lot of yes. our desires are also fulfilling people's financial needs. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think in some ways we need to detach ourselves from that to kind of think about what do I actually, how do I find happiness, right, in the long run? And happiness doesn't mean you're happy every day. It just means you have peace with yourself and you're happy with what you're doing and you're fulfilled with what you're doing. And you're, um, and I think to achieve those things, you need to try a few things and know what you like and what you don't like. And, you know, give it your best, give it your all, oh, all the energy you have, throw it into there. So then, in the end, when someone says, you know, uh, you're not good on this or, you know, you haven't given it your, your best energy, at least, you know, yourself, you have and you can live uh, in peace, I think. I can hear how all these pieces now you're putting it together. You're putting patience and doing your best and commitment and resilience. Like you're putting it all together. I can I can see the big picture now. You know, I can see the puzzle. Uh, <laughs> Before they what? were the puzzle pieces, and now I can see the picture. So, uh, Peter, I asked you many questions today. Let me close with this one. Is there one that I, I haven't asked you yet, but you would like me to ask while we're still together? Um, I'll need to think about this. <laughs> well, it's my closing question, so you don't have much time. <laughs> I probably like the only question you, you could ask is how do you, what are you doing next? Or like, um, what's next? Cause we spoke a lot about my history, but we didn't speak about the future. And if you were to ask me that question, okay, my how? response would be, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well then, <laughs> We're going to need to wait a few months <laughs> to know so that we can talk about the past, which is really going to be the future if we look at it from this perspective. Uh, how interesting. You know, I have a sense that you have an idea of what's next. And in, in, in what you, all the puzzle pieces that you shared with me today, I think that they 
can also be rearranged differently to create a picture that we call the future. And the sense that I have about you is that you believe and you can rearrange the puzzle pieces to create a, a picture that it's going to bring you peace, that it's going to give you what you want. And it's going to let you live in the moment, in the present, not worrying about the future and not, you know, being too much attached to the past. But really enjoying the now with your family, in your house, with the work that you do, with the adventures that you choose to bring into your life. And and if if we have that peace, the what's next will show up. We don't always need to know it. Almost like we don't need to know it because we're gonna <laughs> recognize it once it show up. So that's the sense that I have about you. And maybe I'll just ask the what's next, as I said, in in a few months. <laughs> I'll check in. So Peter, if Anybody got inspired to connect with you? What's the best way for the audience to connect with you? Sure. So um, I don't have loads of social media, but I do have LinkedIn, right? So I'm just search for Peter Johnson. I know there's a very common name, but um, I also have a, a, my own website, which I blog sometimes when I get the time. <laughs> um, so that's peterintest.com, which is probably more unique uh identify to find me um but... i will add them in the notes so people don't have to search for them cool yeah that, that's yeah. basically why i am i'm mainly on linkedin and um sometimes i vlog great well thank you very much for being here i really appreciated your time great now andrea thank you for the invitation i really appreciate it and it's been you've made me think uh, a lot about um my values, right. And how I think and, um, take this journey back through, you know, the last 10, 15 years of my life. And I think it's been quite nice to revisit that period. Cause I, sometimes we forget about where we came from and the struggle we've had or, you know, what we've gone through, you know, the journey we've, we've taken so far. Yes. It sounds like it was very worth for you. So thank you very much for sharing. I wanted to share it with with the world with others at least with one person so thank you thank you again